Hi, I'm Janice Farnhills Province, and this is a quick review of hemodynamic principles. So if we look at the word hemodynamics, what does it actually mean? So heme means blood, dynamis means movement. So put it all together, and hemodynamics means the movement of blood. So why do we care? Well, because if our hemodynamics are out of whack, then we've got issues. And as the bedside nurse, we're able to manipulate patient's hemodynamics in order to achieve desirable outcomes. Let's look at some quick definitions before we start. So cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected each minute during ventricular con contractions. So if you think about it, an organ the size of our fist is able to pump out two to four of these two liter Coke bottles per minute. Pretty incredible. And then the cardiac index is corrected for the patient's body size. So a little old lady who weighs 80 pounds is not going to have the same cardiac output as a 350 pound linebacker, for example. So instead we look at the cardiac index. Stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected during ventricular systole. And then ejection fraction is just the percentage of blood pumped out of the left ventricle during systole. And so remember that Whenever your heart pumps, it doesn't completely empty. So there is almost up to 50% of the blood there. So the ejection fraction is looking at that percentage. And then the systemic vascular resistance is um, what's in the vasculature. So how toned are the vessels? Are they completely dilated out? So we have a lower number of our SVR, or are they nice and tight or too tight, for example, and not letting any blood flow go through. All right, what are the factors that affect blood pressure? So when we put a cuff on a patient and take the blood pressure, we're looking at the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. And the cardiac output has two components. So the cardiac output is made up of the heart rate and the stroke volume. And then if we look at the stroke volume, that's made up of three components. So we have the preload, which is the volume dumping into the ventricle. We have the contractility, the pump, the force. And then we have the afterload, so the vessel tone. Preload is the volume of blood returning to the heart from the venous side waiting to be ejected. Contractility is the force of contraction, how well the heart is beating. And then afterload is the resistance that the heart has to put out, push out against of the vessels. So are the vessels clamped down or are they wide open? Here's my little picture of how I view hemodynamics. So you've got your heart in the middle of the picture and then you've got the volume that's dumping into the heart. That's your preload. And then what's coming out of the heart is the blood and it's going against the afterload or the resistance. So how do we measure preload? So in the ED, we only have the CVP. If you were to put a Swan GANS catheter in a patient, you would be able to measure both right and left heart. And the right heart would be the CVP or the right atrial pressure. And that's anywhere from 0 to 10 or 2 to 6, depending on what textbook you look at. And if you had a swan in, you could also measure the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. In the ED, we don't have this. So we have already talked in one audio bite about how to measure the CVP waveform and get an accurate reading on that. So I'll refer you to that audio bite. Okay, so again, preload is the amount of volume returning to the heart. It's the blood volume in the ventricles waiting to be ejected. And it's dependent on how full the tank is. So the total volume in the venous bed or the diastolic venous return. And then we can also talk about Starling's law of optimal stretch. And this has to do with the systolic ejection. So we'll get to that more in a little bit. So, I like to think of preload as like filling up a water balloon. So if you think of the preload, the volume again, as the water going into the water balloon, then you have the balloon starting to stretch. The more water in the balloon, the greater the stretch. And what Starling's Law says is the more the heart muscle stretches during diastole, which is the filling, the more forceful the contraction is going to be during systole. So there is an optimal stretch period. 
Okay, here's another way to think about Starling's Law using a rubber band. So your rubber band being your heart muscle. And if you wrap the rubber band around two fingers and then you stretch it out about three inches and you let one side go, it's going to contract back really well. Right? So that's optimal stretch. And then if you were to only stretch it out maybe about one inch, then it's going to contract back when you let it go. It's going to contract back with less force probably not hurt when it snaps your other finger. So that would be like an example of a hypovolemic patient, um, somebody who's either bled out or is dehydrated. So there's little stretch and that equals little squeeze. Whereas if you stretch out the rubber band like six to eight inches and then let it go back, that's gonna be a big snap. That's equivalent to like a fluid challenge. So it contracts back stronger and faster. Now if you think about the rubber band and you've been stretching it and stretching it and stretching it and overstretching it and pulling it and pulling it, what happens if it's all those muscle fibers get too stretched out? Think about the big boggy heart or like a patient with CHF. So you have too much fluid in there and the muscle fibers can't contract back well. So that is Starling's Law. All right, so again, preload is volume. What are some agents that reduce our preload or dilate out that tank? It would be like Lasix or furosemide, our venodilators like nitroglycerin that are going to expand that tank size dumping into the heart. So our preload is going to be reduced. Our CVP number is going to be reduced. Agents that increase our preload or fill the tank or constrict the tank. We have um, crystalloids like normal saline and lactated ringers. We also have colloids. There's a handful of other things that can affect our preload as well. So again, this is the volume and what's affecting our diastolic filling. All right, let's talk about contractility now. So we've already discussed Starling's Law. So which of these two water balloons, when they are removed from the spigot, if they're not pinched off nice and tight, which one is going to shoot water further? The one on the left, which isn't filled as much, or the one on the right? Exactly, the one on the right. So the greater the stretch, the more forceful the contraction. And then contractility, as we've already discussed, is influenced by preload, or the amount of volume that goes into the heart. So again, contractility is the force of the contraction. It's the strength. It's the ejection force for moving the preload against the afterload. And it's dependent on oxygenation and electrolyte um, balance, pH, preload, afterload, all those good things. All right, what are some things that are going to decrease contractility or the force of contraction? So if a patient has a low K, a low mag, a low calcium, or they're uh, hypoxic, or they've had an MI, all of those can affect contractility. And then what can increase contractility or improve it? So inotropes, drugs that are going to make our heart pump better. So dibutamine, even dopamine, epinephrine, all of those there, calcium as well, can increase contractility. All right, as you can see, there is quite a list of things that can affect our contractility. So again, we've talked about preload and afterload, or myocardial oxygenation, electrolyte imbalances, and there's other things like drugs or acidosis or um, sepsis, sympathetic or parasympathetic nerve stimulation, hypothermia, cardiac hypertrophy, or a tamponade or even restrictive pericarditis. All of those can affect the way our heart pumps. On to afterload. So how do we measure afterload? Well, in the ED, again, if we, if we had a swan, which we don't in the ED, we would look at either the pulmonary vascular resistance, the PVR, or the systemic vascular resistance, the SVR. So the lower the number, the more dilated out the patient's vessels are. That's the tone. And the higher the number, the more clamped down they are. All right, back to our water balloon analogy here. So when you have a water balloon, if you were to put that base in your hands and you're going to squeeze the water and you have your fingers pinched around the neck of the balloon, depending on how pinched you have your fingers, that's going to be your afterload or the resistance when you try to squeeze the water out of the balloon. So if you have a loose grip on the neck, and you squeeze that out, that's a lower SVR, whereas if you have a tight 
um, squeeze around the neck with your fingers and you try to squeeze the water out, that is an increase in your SVR or your afterload. So afterload is the pressure the ventricles must work against to push the blood out of the body or the ventricles. So some definitions here. Again, afterload is the amount of resistance the heart has to push out against. It's the resistance to the ejection um, from the ventricles and it's dependent on the vessel status. So we talk in terms of the patient being clamped down. Um, so again, it's the tone and how, how clamped or dilated out the patient's vessels are. How hard is the heart having to work to get that blood out of the ventricle? So what are some agents that are going to reduce our afterload? Vasodilators. So nipride or nitroprusside or nitroglycerin um, both reduce the afterload. And then agents that are going to increase our SVR or the afterload are going to be vasoconstrictors like norepinephrine or epinephrine or dopamine. There are a handful of things that can affect our afterload. The list on the left are items that can affect our pulmonary vascular resistance. So you can see that pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary embolus are things that are going to affect the lungs. On the right hand side, we have a list of things that are going to affect the SVR or systemic vascular resistance. So dropping down, you can see that like spinal or distributive shock, those can affect the SVR, the tone of the vessels. So in, in distributive shock, you know that the vessels dilate out. So your SVR would be a lower number. All right, so in review, we have your preload, that's your volume. We have the contractility, which is the force. And we have afterload, which is the resistance. So what does it all mean? Let's, let's do a little quick uh, case here. We have Mrs. Septic Shock, who arrived from a con home. She was hypotensive, tachycardic, and altered with very little urine output. What do you think is causing her hypotension? So, right, is it the, her SVR and her preload, are those going to be up, down, one or the other? So we're going to have a decrease in the SVR and a decrease in her preload. So her, she's dilated out, that's her SVR her, or her uh, afterload. And then her preload, she's hypotensive, so her tank, she might be in distributive shock, so her tank might be bigger that drops her preload as well. So why is her SVR low? Because of the vasodilation from the inflammatory response. And then why is the preload reduced? Because the tank is bigger, her intravascular volume. What's causing her tachycardia? So that is going to be a compensatory response for the low SVR or the tone that she doesn't have and the low preload or the volume that she doesn't have because her tank is so big. Also, it could be a response to the fever. So what about her cardiac output? Do you think it's going to be high or do you think it's going to be low? So typically with septic shock patients, cardiac output is going to be high because <clears throat> the body wants to compensate for the low SVR, the, the vessels being dilated out, and then increase the metabolic needs related to sepsis. So summarizing septic shock, is the preload up or down? It's going to be down. And then is the afterload going to be up or down? It's going to be down. So that's your vessels. And then the preload was the volume. And then contractility, is it up or is it down? And it is up. Good job. So how are we going to treat this patient if we're using early goal-directed therapy as our guide, oxygen, mechanical ventilation if necessary, and then we're going to fill the tank with fluids, get the um, titrate to a heart rate, and a MAP, a mean arterial pressure, of 65. We're going to look at the urine output, her skin perfusion, her mental status. If we put in a CVP, we're going to be looking at a CVP between 8 and 12. If she's intubated, 12 to 15. We're going to get blood products on board if her hematocrit is too low, and if her SVO2 is too low, we're going to start antibiotics right away, and then vasopressors to tone her up. So once her tank is full, we can give inotropes as well, like Levofed, to increase her blood pressure and also increase her SVR or her tone. 
All right, so again, when we think about preload, think about CVP, that's our measurement. Think about the tank, that's the volume. What's dumping into the heart? What's dumping into the venous system? So if the patient's bleeding out, or if they have drugs like nitroglycerin, for example, that are gonna dilate them out, that's gonna reduce their preload. And then adding volume or to that tank is going to increase the preload. Contractility, again, is the force. It's the strength of the heart during ejection, the stroke work index, so individualized for that particular patient. It moves the preload or the volume out against the afterload, which is the resistance. And um, what's going to reduce contractility? Ischemic hearts, so in somebody having an MI, and the electrolyte imbalances as well, as well as a decreased sympathetic tone. And then what's going to improve our contractility? Drugs like inotropes, like our dibutamine, dopamine, epinephrine, um, calcium as well, to increase the contractility or that force. And then how about afterload? That's our resistance. That's our SVR is our measurement. What um, the heart is pushing out against, is the patient clamped down or not? So it's the diameter of the hose of the vessels. It's the arterial system versus the venous system. Vasodilators are going to reduce our um, afterload. So they're going to dilate out the caliber of the vessels or increase that hose size. And then what about what increases our afterload? Vasoconstrictors like levofed, so for our septic patient, for example, those are all going to affect that. All right, back to our drawing now to sum it all up. So we have the heart, the star in the middle. And what's dumping into the heart is the preload that comes from the venous side. We measure it with our CVP. It dumps it into the heart, and then the heart uses force and contractility to pump that blood out against our afterload that goes to the arterial side. And if we had a swan in, we would use SVR to measure that afterload or the resistance, the tone of the vessels. Thanks for listening.